Welcome to the land of Erion, or what survives of it. Long ago, it was the home of many majestic empires. Those of the humans, the elves, the marrow, the dwarves and oread, the okiti, and the kobolds. But as is the nature of man, those who had power wanted more. Civil war broke out across all of Erion, and the kobolds, in desperation when it seemed they would lose, summoned what they thought was a dark, draconic god to save them. They instead called forth Dragotha. A dragon of dark and terrible power, Dragotha cared not for the suffering of anyone, only to spread destruction and death. After a last desperate alliance finally slew the great dragon, the empires realized they were in no place to continue the fight, and the Great War ended. Thirty years later, Port Mirandu, capital city of the humans in Erion, was bustling with celebration of a harvest festival, a collection of the greatest foods and wines from across the continent. Arriving to celebrate, alongside his master Arias Imaklu, was Momo Sansvol, an Arakakwa cleric, which caused no shortage of stares, as even with his short stature and young age, he was a rarity, for Arakakwa were extinct in Erion. But as Momo went into the main tent to pick up some elven wine for his master, he turned and Arias was gone. Not only that, but no one seemed to have remembered the priest that took in Momo. In his desperation, he looked around and found two interested parties who vowed to help him. Trevlon Bluequill, a halfling bard and a journalist reporting on the festival, and Malifane Lythos, a half-elf rogue, who was merely people-watching. The three continued to search the festival, searching the battle ring and finding Thavagath, Mountain Smasher, Nukalathula, a Goliath barbarian and a member of the fledgling Gladiators Guild of Erion, who didn't seem all that interested in gladiatorial combat, even when his opponent didn't show. Immediately taking a liking to Momo, Thavagath vowed to help the young bird. Another search, this one of the market stalls, had our heroes meet with Corellian Velez, a kobold paladin working for the Tinker's Guild. He seemed occupied with thoughts of his own, but when he learned that his shift was over, he said his last job for the Tinker's Guild was done and agreed to accompany the group in search of Arias Imaklu. Our heroes thus assembled, they headed for the Fiery Grog Tavern, a raucous dive bar where Arias had made reservations over the next several months. They met many colorful characters, Guglug the half-orc bouncer, who was more magically inclined than brute, Zelana Vallejo the elven mage, beating all challengers at mage hand wrestling, Durkon of the Wild Axe clan, a drunk and fierce dwarf eager for a fight, Ari, the merfolk dancer, who had an amulet that gave her legs at the cost of her voice, and Tofdir Duflame, gnomish bartender of the fiery grog, who previously might have been a smuggler, none of whom, unfortunately, remembered Arias Emaklu. However, they did have jobs for us. Tofdir had an infestation of rats in his basement that turned out to be using a massive cavern built underneath the tavern. Upon discovery of the caverns, he upped the reward, and Salana asked us to look into whether or not her grandmother, who had gone adventuring many years ago, was in the cavern system. In the dark caverns, however, a complication arose. Malifane had a split personality, Eskal, who came out in the darkness. Existing to get a rise out of people, Eskal quickly got on all of our nerves, but nevertheless agreed to help, so long as we all helped Malifane. Within the caverns, we found the corpse of an elven woman, Salana's grandmother, who was part of an adventuring party hired by Lord Stormkirk, a noble from across the seas, to retrieve his warhammer, Storm's Herald, which I picked up after braving a monster-invested tunnel. <laughs> Further investigating the strange underground lair, we found a sacrificial dagger at an altar to the Deep Ones. Several mutated rats, including an incredibly smart rat named Nibbles, and a mad were-rat alchemist, calling himself the Rat King. Maddened by exposure to something called the Old Voice, he ranted and raved about how he was going to save the world from an oncoming calamity. Only for us to lock him in a certain indestructible armoire and send him off to jail. We spent the next few days exploring Port Morandu getting to know the sights and sounds of the city, including its mayor, Morkid Lionbelly, 
who Trevlon had made an enemy of, after a report insinuating that he had something to do with the city's slave trade. And Golmot Gidango, Trevon's rather terrifying boss and head of the journalism guild. With no leads as to where Oriz went, or even why no one remembered him, we were interrupted by news of an attack on Panmia Academy, the hero training academy of Port Mirandu. When we arrived, the halls were mostly evacuated, and the academy was under assault by a page golem, a creature created out of spellbooks that seemed hell-bent on causing rampant destruction. After a nearly fatal encounter, we were pulled into a closet the golem seemed unable to enter, due to a student by the name of Annabelle Wheelwright, who explained that the golem suddenly came to life in the forbidden section of the library, advising us on what items they could get into the academy to give them a chance at fighting the thing, Annabelle helped us brew up and prepare several enchanted items before we finally confronted and slew the creature. In our investigations of Panmere Academy, we discovered a book by Glinquanol, an alchemist who looked quite like the Rat King, if he were younger and not insane, that is. Annabelle informed us that Glinquanol used to be a respected alchemist to royalty, but he killed his wife. When interrogating the captive Rat King about this, he had a brief moment of lucidity, saying he didn't kill his wife, and Trevlon, believing him, set the Rat King free. But neither he or Momo chose to inform the rest of us. Shortly afterwards, our heroes were contacted by a mysterious old man named, rather appropriately, Old Ran, who explained he was a middleman for people willing to pay adventurers for their service, offering to take on the heroes. He also said that along the journey, they might be able to find answers to their inner turmoil. Our heroes, intrigued by the promise, and also by the massive amounts of money Old Ran was freely sharing around, agreed. Our first official job was with a marrow, a fish-like humanoid similar to merfolk, but different enough that Ari did not seem pleased by the association, by the name of Kailani. A practicing priest in the marrow city of Shimmering Lights, he explained that kobolds had recently set up an oil rig near the city, and had made a business agreement with the marrow to share some of what they dug up in return for use of the location. However, the longer the rig was in operation, the more Blackwater-like tar leaked out, even though it was making several Marrows sick. According to the contract, and the Marrows government, this Council of Scylla, nothing could be done. So, we travelled with Kailani to the City of Shimmering Lights, talking to him about the city, the Deep Ones and their curse, and all sorts of other topics, before settling in and attempting to make our case to the Council. However, Gwynemir, the Marrow's High Priestess had rigged the hearing against us. She called upon the Marrow's massive queen, Arista, in an effort to fluster and intimidate Kailani into silence, all while convincing the other council members to remain stoic as stone walls and stand against everything we said. We all made as good a case as we could, but we did not gain enough votes to sway the council. However, Mizuko, jeweler, crystal smith, and member of the council, called us to a secret midnight meeting. His daughter, Jenny, was among those made sick by the Cobalt Oil Rig. He would lend us his aid, and about to get to the rig secretly, if we vowed to kill Nuglo, the Cobalt chieftain responsible for the digging. Esgal had several objections, as he and Malifane shared pacifistic ideals, but the rest of us didn't have as many qualms about getting our hands dirty. After a long argument, we eventually got onto the rig, and learned that the kobolds were working with dark magic of some kind as they dug up the oil, and after several harrowing encounters, we found and killed the kobold who was overseeing the operation. We had also found a kobold alchemist, and we convinced, or threatened, him into taking over the operation and halting all the digging, though he did make a point to mention that the Marrow, with their apparently draconian contract, would not be happy. As we got back to shore, we were welcomed by the city guards and a few of the council members. The council was irate about our disobedience and crimes in town, but having pleased the mermaid queen herself through sheer luck and some beautiful music, we barely managed to survive the trial. Having escaped certain death, or bonelessness, we were then told by a bitter high priestess Gwynemir to leave her city. Meeting back up with old Ram, we received another job, this one from Solana, to escort her back to Ashranalora, City of the Elves, 
as she was now ready to return home and contract a branch of the elven military, known as the Shisen Thay. Learning of corruption in their sacred grove that was making animals and plant life violent to all passers-by, we and Solana teamed up with the mercenary band of elves, including Ravanala, their leader and a battle-focused barbarian, Omarin, an elven carpenter in a city run by dryads, who had managed to build a flamethrower, Umarek, a druid who controlled swarms of bees, Sarada, a dryad infused with necrotic energy who specialized in fear, Aloris, a male banshee who fought at Ravanala's side, even after death, and Nainoran, an ancient elven sniper. Nainoran, however, was a rarity, as he remembered Momo's master, a man who seemed intent to spread the worship of Malil, demigod of song, across the land. And, in the city of the elves, I... I learned of a situation with my mother, a human former mercenary. She had lost her ongoing battle with drink and despair. She was currently comatose in a hospital in the town of Baylight. <clears throat> this on our minds, we guarded by the Shisen Thay made a dash into the Sacred Grove, transporting ourselves into a realm forged by the Fae, and teaming up with Solana to purge it of corruption. It wasn't an easy task, however. We came face to face with two guardians, a Plague Lord mercenary alchemist who had apparently set up the corrupting enchantment, and a Carrion Moth, an insect native to the north of Irion, where the Oread had settled in. Given that the Oread had only recently taken back their city from the dwarves, and seemed loath to reopen trade routes with the elves, it seemed that there was tension brewing there, which the Shisen Thay vowed to look into with their new recruit, Solana. We pursued the market at Ashra and Alora one last time, running into some interesting faces. Lord Eberdon, for instance, a high elf that seemed to hold some grudge against Corellian, and a mysterious fey woman who made several bargains with members of our party before vanishing. We took one last rest in Ashran Alora, but we were attacked in the night by a dream wraith, which nearly killed Corellian, and told us all that the Rotheart sends her regards. On their way back home, however, our heroes were intercepted by Lord Stormkirk, who had been summoned by Lionbelly upon seeing our heroes with his hammer. Electrocuting and essentially kidnapping our heroes after taking his hammer back, Stormkirk placed them in charge of a renovation project, Battenrant's Hall. He made it clear that while the heroes were free to develop it how they chose, they did so under his direction, and owed him a favor in exchange for their lives. Our heroes started buying up and helping build various structures to improve the ancient hall, including an alchemist slab, where they hired their old friend Annabelle, a shrine staffed by Kailani of the Marrow, and a stable, run by a kobold by the name of Chickenbait, who had somehow managed to tame a cockatrice. As our heroes requested mail be redirected to that new address, Momo received a letter, one of the only ones he'd actually gotten since he arrived on Erion, rambling about a dragonborn barbarian named Otar the Fowl, who had apparently killed and eaten Momo's parents, coming back from the dead, and the powers of creatures called the Anunnaki. We had little time to dwell, as old Ren arrived with another job from Prince Zordan of the Oread, who said that Minotaurs were digging in their sacred mines and he wanted them out. Traveling to Demdor, newly liberated city of the Oread, we learned from talking around town, mostly to a smith named Gugmek, who took one look at me and said that I was ready to fly, if only I had the courage, that other members of the Oread's ruling sectors were cool with the Minotaurs being there. However, their feelings were moot as the rules were crystal clear. Whoever won a great gladiatorial match won the right to enter the mines, and Thavagath, being a gladiator, was keen to lead us. We looked for more information, and we found two sources, one of them being Magdor McPadrug a necromancer and one of the only dwarves left in Demdor, who warned us about a mad lich queen named Stavana Rothart, and started teaching me and helping me with my newly discovered aptitude for necromancy. The other was a dream druid by the name of Kuldra, who informed us of a sunken city named Yorhum, where much of Old Ren's money and artifacts seemed to come from, and she tried to use dreams to send messages on our behalf, but she was assailed on many fronts by Dendar the Night Serpent, and a harsh voice that screamed at me 
that, that any further attempt to contact my master would result in Arias's fingers being destroyed. Before the match happened, however, the Fey Woman's bargains came into play. Known as Kinslayer, he shared with us that, in a desperate search for power, he flew into a blind rage at the urging of a mysterious man in a robe, and killed his entire family, fleeing his clan and from his home to get away from the shame, but not regretting any of it. Using his reputation to try and intimidate the mighty Oriad, Thavagath led us to victory in the gladiatorial match against Durkin and his men, earning the respect of Crocodile, head of the Gladiators Guild. Listen, I said I was sorry a million times, why do you have to keep bringing it up? Within the Sacred Mines, we encountered several strange alien insectoid creatures on our way to confront the Minotaurs, who were there on the orders of their ruler, Jetika Iron King, to dig up, well, iron. They had also set up several mole bands throughout the mines, slaves of the Iron King, to attack any intruders. And an attempt to persuade a knoll to join our side ended in tragedy when I when I took my sacrificial dagger and devoured the knoll's soul. Horrified, Thavagath took the dagger, and my friends lost a good bit of their faith and their trust in me, leading to tensions between us as we encountered the Underhill King, leader of the dwarves of Arion, who made us a deal. Retrieve for him the Heart of Stone within the mountain, and he would help us clear out the insects and minotaurs. The Heart of Stone was a sentient creature, looking into all of our hearts and judging us for every sin we had committed. Maddened by enchantment magic, the stone-like creature was laid low by explosives of elven design placed around the arena, and the Heart of Stone itself lost color and fell. Unwilling and unable to give it back to the Underhill King, we were left for dead at the bottom of the mineshaft. But we were saved by Prince Zordan, who we had alerted to our presence. Back on the surface, Asgall stewed, feeling as if he was held back thanks to Malifane's pacifist nature, a nature to which the rest of the party objected as well, and their ever-shrinking tolerance of Asgall himself. The elven woman returned with a deal, the separation of the two personalities into new bodies, a deal that I gladly took, much to Malifane's chagrin terror. Exhausted from their journey, our heroes made the trip back to Battenman's Hall, but on their way encountered Gruvon Gorewalker, leader of the Plague Lords, who seemed most displeased at Malifane taking the items of his son Ashton, and attempted to rip out Malifane's brain for his split personality. But, upon learning that Esgal was no longer with him, left the party alone for now. More and more wounded by the day, our heroes finally arrived back at Battenman's Hall to rest. Back at the hall, our heroes continued to develop the land and the manor, meeting and reuniting with a variety of interesting characters, including Maggie Lionforge, a retired knight bringing with her several refugees from Farfield, a town that was ravaged by minotaurs under the Iron King. Mr. Fox, a Yugoloth that appeared from nowhere wanting access to the manor's basement. Gugmek the Oread, now hired as the in-house smith. A band of young Morlocks, Ishka, the Arakakra ghost of the manor's last major domo, and Quintessa Creena, the librarian, and Malifane's fiance. News from Port Mirandu arrived shortly thereafter. News that Toftir had been arrested in connection with the smuggling caverns below the Fiery Grog Tavern, and that Trevlon's sister Shayla, cleric of the Temple of Erion, had been receiving visions of a city beneath the sea, and an Arakakra author named Geyser. It was Lord Stormkirk who contacted us again, calling in his favor to get the aid of four Port Mirandu nobles, including Mayor Morkin Lionbelly, and outbid the banker Naluna Lad for ownership of a district in the slums. I objected, however, given that in my past I was contracted for a similar job, to get money so I could afford medicine for my mother, but I was left for dead after completing the work, and my mother passed away. In the middle of our whining and dining, the Akiti, Ratmen of the Slums, made their own bid, and in response, their leader, Captain Vincent, was kidnapped. The next day, Jemvik, the interim leader of the Akiti, countered by holding a distracting festival in the town, during which he robbed and kidnapped several people, including my sister Vavira, bastard. Remig, an Okiti monk and the last free member of Captain Vincent's guard, approached us with a plan. 
free Captain Vincent, and surely the other prisoners would go free as well. Dealing now with multiple parties, we infiltrated a temporary base used by the Four Kings Mercenary Band, defeating the bandits within and interrogating them, with Malafane taking special interest due to his mother's former ties with them. Captain Vincent was freed, but he was far from grateful and he gave Momo another sacrificial dagger as incentive to let him go without further incident. And he also left me with a broken rib just to make the point. After a talk with me, Momo realized his true strength and true faith came from within and cast the cursed weapon aside, rejoining us with a new spring in his step. The next day, most of the captors were freed, but others were still held ransom at Ratwald Road, which, when we investigated alongside the fugitive, Ari, we found to be another laboratory of the Rat King. Another great battle ensued and the lab was destroyed. The captives being barely pulled out before the entire place went up in smoke. We also decided to take the Rat King as well because why not? At the auction, thanks to the bonds and deals we had made with the Port Miranda nobility, we outbid Nalun Ilad. But the auction house was attacked by Akiti. They bombed the place with chemical weapons and killed several bystanders. Attempts to interrogate them proved fruitless, and attempts to interrogate the Rat King led to him telling me off. For why should he bother helping the men who destroyed his labs twice in the span of a few months, locked him in a cupboard, left him to die, and insisted we be friends? I don't know, just because we've managed to save your life a couple times in the process. Either way, that bond broken, we had no other leads but to investigate rumours of a deal along Rosewater Stream. And a deal we found indeed. The mad Captain Vincent talking to a plague lord by the name of Ectorus Strain, apparently negotiating in exchange for alchemical ingredients. But we were discovered, and rather than fight a desperate battle on three fronts, we ran, abandoning the slums and leaving Port Morandu while we still could. Our heroes returned to Baton Rance Hall, accompanied by Estreo Kiti Gutterat by the name of Rayana Kiki, whom Momo and Malafane immediately took a liking to. Back at the hall, our heroes rested and relaxed, continuing their renovation projects, along the way building an Arcanist research room, which was staffed by another Okiti, the eccentric Torkalin and his familiar, Nibbles, the former familiar of the Rat King himself. But as our heroes continued to dig deeper towards the basement of the former manor, they happened upon the other two legendary ghosts of Batonrand's Hall, Jennifer, a headless horsewoman, who apparently was responsible for the decline of the Hall so many years ago, and Lord Josiah Battenrance himself. They even had time to celebrate the Night of Lost Ale, a holiday across the Ten Realms to which Irion belonged, and took the time to remember those they had lost and celebrate the community they had gathered around themselves, including the makeshift family that was, indeed, our heroes. But before they could further investigate Lord Josiah Battenrance and his promises of power beyond their wildest imagination, our heroes were called forth by Old Ran, who had another task for them, this one for the kobolds of the northern capital city of Merdil, or rather two rebels, Zutzag Bronzai, a rifleman, and Snalgu, a former priestess, both of which wanted to take down a reborn dragon. It's here where we rejoin our heroes on the way up to Merdil, despite their apprehensions, whether it be taking on a dragon or otherwise. And yet, there's more to this tale than there might seem. So stick around through the coming weeks, and we shall see what lies behind and beyond the Fallen Empire.